Good morning, everyone. We're going to get started in just a moment, so I'd like to ask you all to take your seats. And I'd also like to welcome you here in Washington, as well as uh, everyone who's joining us on the web this morning. It's quite chilly here in D.C. after just a, a bit of snow. Uh, but we're glad to see all of you uh, for this event on translating international models of care for high-need, high-cost populations in the United States. This is part of a core theme of the research efforts at the Duke Margolis Center for Health Policy. I'm Mark McClellan. I'm the director of the Duke Margolis Center. Uh, and again, uh, we very, we're very pleased for the people who have come uh, together here uh, in Washington, despite the weather, to, for this important discussion of models of accountable care from around the world. We're aiming to address some of the urgent and global challenges related to improving care and lowering costs and finding health policies that can sustain uh, and advance these new innovative models or transformations of care, particularly for high-need patients that account for most of the costs and most of the opportunities for delivering better care. Uh, I want to give a special thanks to all the speakers and participants in this effort, uh, the people who have made this journey here, sometimes from quite a long ways, to make this event possible. A couple of brief housekeeping items before we get started. Uh, we are video recording today's event, as well as broadcasting live via webcast. A full report recording of the event is going to be available on our web page, our website, and the uh, event page on our website in the coming days. And to ensure the audio quality of the recording, there are going to be a number of opportunities for questions and comments from the audience. We'd like to remind you to uh, turn off your cell phones, uh, put them on silent, and save the questions for that Q&A portion. For the people who are joining us virtually, as well as any of you in person who are on social media, we invite you to participate by sending questions using the hashtag global health and hashtag healthcare reform global health and health care reform. Uh, we're also going to have uh, some help keeping track of the time uh, so that we stay on schedule for the, the speakers up here at the front. Um, so we've got four parts to our agenda today, uh, for those of you who are following along on the slides. First, I'm going to provide a brief overview of our accountable care analysis, including the highlights from some of the global case studies we've analyzed as part of this effort. Then a panel of the leaders involved in three of these global efforts will discuss some of the lessons that they've learned that they think could have implications for health care reform here in the United States and in our policies to support those reforms to get better outcomes and lower costs. In the second panel, my colleague Krishna Udayukumar will moderate a panel with, four, with uh, three experts on the U.S. side, uh, healthcare leaders and policymakers who will discuss their perspectives on how global experiences like these can actually be applied by healthcare organizations in the U.S. That was going to be four. Uh, one of our panelists, Lou Sandy, was affected by that uh, Delta computer outage last night, uh, so is unlikely to be able to make it in time this morning. And then finally, we're going to close the session with some uh, uh, closing comments from Robin Osborne of the Commonwealth Fund. The Commonwealth Fund has been instrumental in making this work and related work possible. So uh, this is about accountable care. Why accountable care? Uh, the idea behind accountable care reforms and our accountable care framework is to support and sustain better care models. Uh, that means policies that align more directly with the goals of what patients want uh, and with the goals of reducing the overall cost of care by promoting coordination and support for services that traditionally under fee-for-service systems or siloed approaches to care delivery uh, would not get much support. This involves switching from paying for volume to aligning payments with what matters most for each patient uh, when they have an illness or chronic disease, and especially when they have a combination of health needs. Today, healthcare can do more than ever before, but costs are growing, and there is persistent evidence that we can do better. Accountable care is about closing those gaps through policy reforms that encourage innovation to get the best care at lowest cost for each patient, especially those with greatest needs. In our previous work, we've defined accountable care as a group of providers that are held jointly accountable for achieving a set of outcomes for a defined population of patients over a period of time and with an agreed cost goal. 
According to this definition, we've also outlined a broadly applicable framework for policymakers to implement accountable care that has five main components. First of all, is starting not on the provider type of service or, uh, or uh, on uh, specific medical products, but on stratifying and targeting a population. This is a population-based approach to policy. Second is constructing and implementing a set of performance measures related to patient quality of care and experience of care. Third is recognizing that change is hard and that policymakers must provide data and other support aiming for continuous improvement, so regular feedback and uh, uh, other support services. Fourth is redesigning financial and non-financial incentives. It's not all about the money, uh, but uh, aligning the finances is really important to make sure payments and regulations match up with measurable improvements in care for the affected patient populations. And fifth for policymakers is identifying and promoting steps to um, enhance care coordination and care transfer. The providers and the patients are delivering the care, uh, but uh, policymakers can take steps to support the implementation of accountable care to make it easier for healthcare care organizations and patients to succeed. The imp implementation of accountable care should be viewed as a process, one that often involves incremental progress and course adjustments, transitional steps, and learning as you go along. Of course, these accountable care policy changes are implemented within the context of a particular health system. And the best path forward, the place to start, depends on the context of the individual health system. And we found in our work around the world that providing this kind of context can help po uh, policymakers here, as well as healthcare organizations, identify examples that might be more relevant to them. So that the healthcare regulatory and market environment matters. Uh, the other thing that matters is the capabilities of the healthcare organizations to succeed under these new models of care. And uh, in the background paper, we have a more complete description of this uh, kind of pyramid framework for thinking about context and policy uh, that influence and can support new organizational capabilities to transform care. So the pyramid summarizes the key features that we found in this work to matter uh, the most. At the context level, this includes broader health policy environmental components, uh, institutional features, political and regulatory features. Uh, at the institutional level, uh, the uh, government regulatory structures can determine how resources are distributed and how easy it is uh, to put together the, the different kinds of silos or policy components that can lead to better population health. The political level uh, involves paying attention to stakeholder interests and uh, motivating groups to, to work together to achieve these population focus improvements. And regulatory infrastructure matters as well, as we'll talk about some this morning, regulations affecting workforce development, regulations uh, affecting the alignment of funding streams or the difficulties in alignment of funding streams, uh, all of those regulatory policy matters, uh, can matter. Um, I've talked some already about the accountable care policy framework. Um, I do, uh, it, it is no accident that the point of the spear uh, in this uh, diagram is the healthcare organizations themselves. Uh, the organizational competencies needed to succeed in these care reform models are, are direct, the uh, direct, uh, reflect the direct activities of providers, uh, and it can be challenging. Uh, the organizational competencies that we're emphasizing uh, are reflect those that have been developed by the Accountable Care Learning Collaborative here in the United States. Uh, supported by the National Academy of Medicine and its vital directions efforts to recognize the new capabilities that organizations need. These are typically less important uh, capabilities in traditional healthcare organizations that are designed to provide services and fee-for-service systems and that have a provider-based viewpoint, for example, focusing on hospital services or primary care services alone rather than a patient-focused viewpoint. Uh, and they include all of the following, all of the elements in, the, uh, in that framework. It includes uh, probably first and foremost governance and culture for organizations, the necessary clinical and non-clinical leadership to strengthen a focus uh, throughout the organization on the patient's whole care experience, not just particular services. It includes financial readiness, the ability to uh, uh, understand and then uh, begin to take on uh, upside or downside financial risk related to performance at the level under care. 
This requires new kinds of health IT infrastructure, not necessarily starting out with uh, uh, very comprehensive electronic health record systems, but rather an IT philosophy that focuses on the most important longitudinal factors for improving outcomes and lowering costs for particular patient groups. Uh, along with that, a focus on patient risk assessment and stratification uh, with a broader range of interventions that could be supported under these payment models. That's the point of moving away from traditional fee-for-service. There's a lot of things that could be done for different patients, and thus a lot of questions about which interventions are really going to make the most difference in particular patient subgroups. Uh, fifth, uh, patient engagement, the ability to embed the patient perspective in the care delivery process and leverage patients' opportunities, which are often the most important, uh, for getting better outcomes. Uh, next is quality and process improvement. So there are uh, a lot of uh, opportunities in the delivery of care uh, to improve uh, uh, the way that care is delivered. There are many important efforts focusing uh, uh, here. We've benefited tremendously in our work from our collaboration with the Institute for Healthcare uh, Improvement, uh, which has identified many ways to uh, improve the operational infrastructure for better care. Uh, and uh, feedback mechanisms to keep improving. And then finally, care coordination, uh, and encouraging healthcare providers uh, in a uh, care system to work together more effectively to improve outcomes and lower costs. There are many organizations uh, around the world that are currently engaged in reforms in payment structures and delivery models, and we've tried to develop a framework that reflects they're starting from different points, they're responding to different opportunities, but they are moving in a common direction. It's a theme that we've seen in the cases we're gonna to present today and many others. Uh, given the ch challenges in designing and implementing accountable care models around the world, and given the challenges in moving in this direction here in the United States, uh, we think there are many opportunities to learn from each other. This morning, we've selected three case studies that demonstrate how reforms can reduce costs and improve health outcomes at the level uh, of particular populations of patients in a wide range of local and policy environments and organizations that were starting from a wide range of healthcare capabilities. They include uh, Gesundes Kinzigtal in Germany, Zio in the Netherlands, and Possible in Nepal. These case studies demonstrate how accountable care is being operationalized in a huge range of settings, the challenges and opportunities to uh, uh, implement, and here today especially, the opportunities to share learnings so that we all can make more rapid progress. Our goal is to use these cases as a means to help providers, health practitioners, and policymakers learn how to create uh, the uh, opportunities and the confidence to implement these reforms towards patient-centered care. Now, I'm going to give you a very brief overview of these three case studies uh, right now. I want to get in the next few minutes to hearing from some of the leaders involved in implementing them, uh, which is going to be the main focus for our uh, meeting this morning. Uh, first up is, uh, so as I mentioned, there, there are uh, three main studies uh, that we're, we're talking about today, um, uh, Zio, Gesundes, Kinzig, tall and possible in Nepal. Uh, first up is possible. This is a nonprofit healthcare company, a new way of doing things to deliver accountable primary care to remote rural populations in Nepal. Possible has been in operation for eight years, serving a population of 440,000 patients. It uses a hub and spoke model with community health workers supported by health professionals and heavy use of telehealth services to reach patients uh, where they are. Among their key outcomes are providing uh, health services for less than $20 per patient. Uh, I guess that's less of an outcome than uh, what's enabled the outcome, which is uh, improvements in infant mortality by 12%, more than two times as many safe deliveries in hospitals, and many, many more patients reached uh, with primary care services that can prevent the complications from their chronic diseases. Uh, some of the key policies that uh, Possible ha has implemented uh, in working with the, uh, uh, the government in Nepal is, again, this focus on identifying high-risk patients uh, for uh, more effective primary care services. Uh, performance uh, that includes tracking a set of 
system-wide outcomes that are tied to the remuneration of providers in the possible system, continuous improvements supported by online management tools and uh, uh, other uh, wireless information gathering technologies and backed up by quarterly and annual impact reports published to include financial information and performance data. Payment reforms that include 20% of the government contract to deliver primary care services tied to performance, uh, these performance measures that I just described uh, at the population level, uh, and care coordination and transformation uh, supported by the government's efforts to uh, enable open use uh, electronic health records uh, platform at all sites of CARES, uh, and uh, the breadth of payment uh, that can include things like telehealth services, the allied health professional services that would not have happened under a traditional payment model with public hospitals and clinics. Uh, the the uh, case study organization itself has developed organizational competencies around multidisciplinary care teams. It's invested in IT, again, not necessarily high-tech, complex electronic health records, but the practical capacity to use telehealth and track key uh, uh, factors to uh, uh, predict which patients need assistance and can respond, and have undertaken uh, quality improvement activities, including project management platforms and an emphasis on staff-driven quality improvement projects. Uh, this is occurring in an environment that I'm sure, as uh, Duncan uh, Amaru will tell you in a little while, is, um, uh, is challenged uh, in, in many ways, particularly for resources, uh, but was done through a public-private partnership. Again, kind of a new direction in many uh, uh, developing countries uh, that enabled a re some redirection of existing resources to support these new models of care. So that's possible health. We're going to hear more about it later. Hope you've had a chance to look at the uh, more detailed case study report uh, that uh, uh, is available on our website as well. Uh, next, going to shift to Zio, which is an integrated care network in the Netherlands that organizes primary care for patients with non-communicable diseases through disease-specific bundled payments with upside and downside risk. So this is accountable care for chronic disease management for uh, the affected populations. This goes back uh, to 1997, treating a population of around 25,000 uh, higher risk uh, chronic disease patients, particularly around diabetes. It's included a number of innovations in care, like task shifting to specialty nurses, this whole team-based care approach, a bundled payment contract that makes that financially sustainable, and then a lot of tools to stratify patients based on their condition-specific needs uh, into the kinds of interventions that are most likely to work for them. Uh, they've seen a 54% decrease in hospital admission uh, costs for patients that are assigned to uh, these specialty programs and a 15% reduction of patients with diabetes who have poor control uh, of their diabetes. Uh, this was made possible, again, by a shift in public policies focusing on uh, populations at risk, uh, so four different categories of, uh, uh, of elevated risk uh, patients. It includes performance measures, uh, that uh, are tied to the bundled payments, uh, process and outcome metrics, in, in addition to some nationally set metrics. It includes an emphasis on continuous improvement through data sharing, uh, data collection and sharing of relevant information with GPs, nurses, and uh, uh, the policymakers involved in overseeing the program. It includes payment changes, as I've mentioned before, the shift to uh, bundled payment contracts uh, with results that are made publicly available. And it includes an emphasis emphasis on supporting care coordination and transformation uh, through uh, the flexibility that the uh, bundled payment contracts provide, as well as efforts by the, uh, the, the government to support uh, using this model as a national standard for supporting better care at the level of a patient's chronic condition management, not just specific services. And some of the uh, um, examples of uh, organizational competencies that ZEO has developed include, uh, as I've mentioned, care coordination with horizontal integration of care with primary care providers and uh, the support system. We'll talk more about that a little bit later. Uh, a change in, government, uh, in, in governance and culture. Uh, and again, uh, a regulatory environment that was facilitative of 
these reforms. For example, legislation that expanded the scope of practice for nurses and physician assistants to enable them to practice at the, uh, at the top of their skill set to provide some prescriptions, to conduct additional medical procedures as part of this team-based effort. Uh, and again, this, uh, the political support here based on um, uh, the early results from this program has facilitated the implementation going from pilots to, to larger scale uh, operation. Uh, finally, uh, last but not least, is our case study on Gesundes Kinzigtal, a privately run physician-led German healthcare management organization that coordinates between multiple levels of providers involved in uh, population health improvement programs. Their patient population includes low-income, elderly, and high-risk individuals with high rates of chronic diseases. This program began in 2004, covers 33,000 people uh, in the region, and its key innovations on the payment side include a long-term, not just one year, long-term shared savings contract for this geographically defined population focusing on whole comprehensive patient management and care improvement. The interventions uh, go beyond healthcare to include public health and social activities and went along with that long-term investment strategy. And uh, overall, the program has achieved significant savings, uh, something like 5% of its uh, base uh, revenues and 92% patient satisfaction rates, uh, particularly including those uh, higher risk patients in the program. Uh, this too uh, was uh, made possible by the implementation of accountable care policy, so defining uh, uh, the population uh, in the region for which the uh, providers and working through Gesundheits Kinzigtal were accountable. Uh, performance measures uh, that included patients and physician involvement in creating uh, the, the, uh, the evaluation metrics. Continuous improvement supported by quarterly performance reports, integrating electronic health record and survey data into a health services uh, cockpit, uh, web-based reports and performance feedback, uh, along with internal and external evaluations along the way to help assess what's working and what could be improved. Uh, there were payment changes involved too, a payment model to replace the traditional kind of siloed and fee-for-service payment system that had been in place before, uh, with additional payments to providers for specific services made possible by this new population focus, and finally an emphasis on care coordination and transformation uh, with a push towards shared decision-making, self-management training courses and resources, other integration of non-medical services, all made possible uh, by the accountable care approach. Uh, the uh, organization itself has undertaken a number of steps uh, to enable it to succeed uh, in this new model, uh, uh, governance and culture that's around the physicians. They're the majority shareholders uh, in the organization and an established now longstanding history of collaboration among physicians in the area. Uh, for patient engagement, there's a patient advisory board included in executive decision-making processes to help assure patient-centered care. Uh, and uh, again, in the environmental uh, context, the uh, political support from implementing and sticking with a long-term strategy on shared savings and investment in, in health improvement uh, has been very important. So, so that's an overview of the cases that you're going to hear about this morning. Uh, more details on more cases are on our website. I encourage you to look there to learn more about uh, these three cases as well as a, a range of others from uh, uh, around the globe. Uh, we are now going to go from overview uh, framework with me talking to uh, discussion with a lot more detail about what has been going on uh, in these three case studies and what some of the implications may be for the United States. So um, we're going to take a very short break now. I'm going to ask our uh, three uh, speakers to uh, come on up to the front. Um, and while they're coming up, I'm going to go ahead and uh, um, introduce them. Uh, so, uh, uh, so that's uh, uh, Duncan and, and Alex and, and Bert. Uh, first off, uh, Duncan Maru uh, is the co-founder and chief strategy officer of Possible Health in Nepal. In his role as chief strategy officer, he oversees the vision and execution of P Possible's work in government partnerships, uh, its impact evaluation, uh, and its approach to implementation science. Duncan's a faculty member at Harvard Medical School in the Brigham and Women's Division of Global Health Equity. He's also a part-time uh, practicing um, uh, uh, pediatrician, I think, at pediatrician, right? At uh, uh, at uh, 
the, in the complex care service at Boston Children's Hospital. Uh, in 2015, uh, he was named a Schwab Foundation Social Entrepreneur of the Year uh, as a result of his leadership uh, in this program. Uh, also joining us is uh, Alexander Pimperl. Dr. Pimperl is, is currently a 2015 to 2016, or, or has been a uh, Harkness Fellow in Healthcare Policy and Practice from Germany, funded by the Commonwealth Fund. Prior to taking up that fellowship, he was the head of the analytics department at Optimetis AG, which is a health science-based management and investment company facilitating integrated care systems throughout Germany and other parts of Europe. In that role, he's been working on accountable shared savings business and performance measurement models for integrated care systems and the replication of the German best practice model that we've just talked about, the Gesundheitskinsiktal model in other regions. Uh, Dr. Pimperl has a PhD in health management uh, and health economics from the Institute of Healthcare Management and Health Economics at uh, the University for Health Sciences, Medical Informatics and Technology in Hall, Austria. And uh, uh, Bert, I hope I'm going to get the pronunciation right, uh, Bert Vrishhoof is uh, the principal research scientist at Maastricht University Medical Center and chief innovation officer at Panaxia in Amsterdam and a visiting professor at the Vrije uh, Universiteit Brussels, Department of Primary Care. He's also editor-in-chief of the International Journal of Care Coordination and previously worked for the McCall Institute for Healthcare Innovation in Seattle, and he too has been a Commonwealth Fund uh, Harkness Fellow in the past. Uh, he has a master's in health policy and management from Erasmus University in Rotterdam, PhD in medical sociology uh, at Maastricht University as well. So it's a, a little bit of an introduction to each of you. And um, as you heard, I tried to do uh, a very brief introduction of the complex uh, programs that you've been implementing. You have to take account, uh, as we've talked about, of uh, political environment. You're really trying to do changes in policy and in care delivery at the same time to facilitate each. Uh, that is not hard hard, I mean, not, not uh, easy, uh, it is hard, uh, as we've seen uh, uh, from a lot of cases around the world, um, and it's something that uh, many healthcare providers in the United States are struggling with as they try to implement new steps to, to bring down costs and improve outcomes and move away from maybe the traditional silos where they've been focused. So I'd like to start out for each of you, maybe Duncan, you, you can go first, on uh, uh, what do you think are the, the main innovations in your model uh, that have made a difference and that could have relevance here in the United States? Thank you so much, Mark, and thank you to the Duke Margolis Policy Center and the Commonwealth Fund. Uh, it's really fundamental uh, to invest in the, the science of, of healthcare delivery at a transnational level in this commitment by the Commonwealth Fund and by the Duke, Duke Margolis Center to uh, embrace this idea that if we're going to improve uh, healthcare systems in the United States and elsewhere, we it, uh, transnational collaboration is essential in, in bringing together evidence and experiences. Um, so as, as far as the, the aspects of, of our uh, approach that I think are most, um, uh, most pertinent here, I'd start by saying that we uh, as, a, as a company now in, in Nepal that's been, uh, been in uh, delivering care for about eight years as as Mark mentioned, we made a, um, a firm commitment from the beginning to, uh, to invest in, in where, where healthcare is going in the future and, um, and to say that, that and try to lead out in front of where the policy and financing environment was. And, and I think we have a number of remarkable um, examples in the United States where, where uh, many of the reforms uh, at a policy level were ultimately led by providers responding to patient needs at their local level and anticipating where uh, policy might go. And so in our case, um, I'd say our, our core um, initial uh, innovation was to, uh, to think about, in, in the Nepal context, was to, th to reimagine the uh, the relationship of, uh, of of citizen and state or public and private services um, in Nepal, you have a um, uh, you have 
uh, really two, two completely parallel uh, systems that live in almost alternative universes. One is a pure public system, which is a, a very centralized, almost kind of monolithic um, state-run entity uh, where um, even at a very local level, uh, e even down to who gets transferred, a, a, a nurse midwife in a rural health post will get transferred on the basis of, uh, of it's in, at times, secretary or ministerial or joint secretary level decisions centrally. Um, and then on the other hand, um, and, that, and that system ha is about $16 per capita per year to get a sense of, of the, the sort of absolute dollar amount of, of investment. On the other hand, you have a purely point-of-care, fee-for-service uh, private system. Uh, there's not really any insurance products in the, in the Nepal market as of yet, and, um, and, that, and, and, and the government is completely um, uh, out of, the, of that. There's no particular regulation um, of the private sector. Um, and, and the private sector is about 65 percent of the healthcare economy in, uh, in Nepal. Um, and so, so we, we identified um, in this really I interesting period, an important period in Nepal's history, uh, right at the end of the Civil War, uh, where you had a new federal, uh, federal republic, um, the monarchy had fallen, and, and a new opportunity for democratic governance um, to uh, reimagine where, how a, how the private sector might be able to uh, collaborate with the government to realize healthcare as a common and public good, um, and and so that was our that was really our first um, a, that and kind of our core um, innovation in in that particular context, and and um, we certainly gained inspiration from. Uh, from uh, innovations from from the in the United States context, for those of you who are familiar with uh, the community health center movement in the United States and and how Medicaid um, what ultimately has has gone uh, in um, in large part to federally qualified community health centers that was that was an innovation that happened in the 1960s that we really um, that people um, and providers around the world have uh, have leveraged for our own experiences um, so that's the that's the the first uh, innovation, and um, I'll I'll move on to I'll let some of the other folks talk in the interest of time. Um, uh, but we we could talk about other other aspects of our uh, of our our model that are core to us are um, a real focus on caring for populations, and, and in Nepal it has a particular geo geo um, uh, the the geopolitical unit in Nepal of of the village development committee and the district. Um, and, and then uh, embedding technology and, uh, and quality improvement within the fabric of the organization. Um, and as a part of really conceptualizing implementation research and the science of healthcare systems as part of the overall enterprise and a as a, uh, um, uh, an ultimate manifestation, in a sense, of the the belief of a of a learning a company or of um, of quality improvement that it that ultimately can reach beyond the boundaries of your own uh, enterprise. Great, uh, Duncan. Thanks for that uh, excellent overview. Uh, Alex, may we turn to you? So, same same question. Uh, um, key innovations that were important uh, uh, in Germany that uh, seem like they might be relevant here too. Thank you, Mark. So I'm also very pleased to be here today, and especially as the last year I've had the chance to learn a lot about uh, the success factors of ACOC in the U.S., and now um, bringing back our German lessons uh, to accountable care in the U.S. And um, so maybe to go back in history, when we started our model, we were already looking at what's going on in the U.S., and we saw all this managed care and HMOs and all this stuff going on here, and we found that this is very interesting and then we, that we want to have something like that in Germany, too. And in 2004, there was a big uh, change in the legislation, and it allowed organizations like us. And... Um, from that starting point, we also said, but we want to do some things differently than in the U.S. We want to make it a little bit more socially fair. And from that, we said, okay, 
let's first do it on a geographically defined region. So we said we don't want to have any gaming uh, possibilities for the providers in the system. Um, we don't want that the provider could do a risk se selection on the basis of the patients. We don't want that these new accountable care organizations just can choose the best doctors and say, um, just the patients that are attributed to the best doctors, let's do that. No, we want to have all doctors. We also want to have to work with the bad performers in the region. And that's why we said, okay, we have to manage a whole region, all patients that are living in these regions. And then we're looking for um, sickness funds who wanted also to cooperate with us. And the second condition was we said, if we want to do that, then we have to take a long-term perspective. Because when we really want to improve population health, then um, the effects and the outcomes will take some time. And then the, uh, that's why the first contract we signed was for 10 years, and it's now uh, prolonged uh, for an indefinite period. So now we are in the, in the follow-up. But f to start, we needed these 10 years to really have the chance to invest and to go for public health and social interventions and prevention. And then to start all that, we needed um, an integrator, like also the IHI uh, says, uh, you need an integrator who, is, who can take over this responsibility. And um, for that, we uh, made this Gesundes Kinsichtar company. And it is owned one third by us, the Optimedis, and two third by the physicians. And this relationship is also because we said, we want the physicians there to be the main owners. So they should uh, get a new perspective where they look at population health and not only at what they are doing in their own practice. And from that, we, the next step was also that we said we have to get the patient on board. And uh, with on board, I mean literally because we made a patient advisory board where the patients are on. And are also deciding what interventions we bring into place and discussing this with us. And we also put uh, some kind of patient ombudsman uh, into the organization so that um, we get their perspective. And uh, as Mark already showed before, we also put a big emphasis on patient activation and patient engagement and also trained our physicians to go in the direction of shared decision making and goal agreements with the patients so that we can activate them. And um, maybe one of the, um, the last uh, things I want to dive into a little bit deeper because it's um, a little bit different to what I experienced here in the US is that um, we focused a lot on the, the culture we wanted to implement, and we wanted to be non-hierarchical. That's maybe also because the German system is built out of independent physicians. You only have salaried physicians in the hospitals, and uh, the independent physicians are really like their own company, even though they never would say they are a company, but they are independent and they want to stay independent. So that's why with our integrator, this Gesundes Kinsichtal um, company, we made contracts with them. And, uh, but the contracts, there were some elements of payment in it, but we tried to keep it really simple and bring them into the system and into the ideas with uh, a lot of work on uh, trust and we wanted uh, to them uh, feel responsible and also when we started there, we worked on that and uh, talked with the leaders of the physician network and they also wanted to improve the care and not just make a little bit more money. Otherwise, it would not have been possible. And we stayed in this direction. And um, to work uh, so that this can work, it's also important that the system is not too big. So it's um, about 60 physicians in this network and this is, um, this is um, a size of an organization where each physician knows the other physician personally. And he can look, or he has to look, in the eye of the other physician and say, I'm doing that and that, and I do it because I think it's good. And he can't hide 
in a big group of physicians where nobody knows what he's doing. And I think it has to stay this small and you can build other regions where you have other accountable care organizations, but every physician there uh, has to know the other parts who are working that. I think that's uh, one of the success factors also. Right, great. Th thanks very much, Alex. Uh, uh, Bert? Thanks, uh, thanks, Mark. Thanks for having me here and uh, also to work with, uh, with your wonderful team uh, as in writing the, the case report. Um, <clears throat> I think, um, as, as you already mentioned, it, it goes without saying that, that we were very much uh, aware that uh, uh, we had to start from understanding the, the complexity of the challenge, right? Um, so we knew from the beginning that there is no uh, simple fix and that we would be uh, in this together as in a, you know, working with each other. Uh, on a on a long journey, so uh, I think, as you rightfully said, it, it all started already in in the mid 90s, and I think we're still not there yet. Um, um, we started from um, I think we we took inspiration from from the Chronica model uh, at Wagner's work, um, um, uh, working on different components and making sure that each of these components that that these are uh, working as a system. Uh, so, so to say, a systems approach. Um, one of the uh, um, first innovative features uh, we took on was a risk stratification. Um, we started uh, to, st to stratify the population, uh, people with certain risks. Um, initially, this was not so much IT supported. Nowadays, it is very much IT supported, uh, but that gave us the oppor opportunity to kind of uh, triage patients between different uh, healthcare providers, as in uh, both the hospital uh, as well as primary care uh, um, uh, physicians. Um, so um, I think the second uh, innovative feature of the, of the Zero Maastricht model is really strengthening primary care, as in um, building a team approach within primary care so not just the uh, the general practitioner who has historically a very um, a strong position within the Dutch healthcare centre, but also making use of uh, of very uh, of highly skilled nurses because we were dealing with people with chronic conditions. So at the end of the day, this is a lot about behavioural issues. So. Um, and uh, GPs are being confronted by a lot of people uh, within their practices, but actually they spend uh, only the minority of their time they get to spend on people with chronic conditions. So that's where, where we brought in the, uh, the nurse specialists. I think thirdly, uh, what is important to stress is uh, we, um, we were lucky to have um, research funding all, uh, all the way long, so we could um, collect data, we could do the analytics, uh, we could make use of objective insights, uh, not just for um, the uh, healthcare providers who were involved, but also um, <clears throat> to convince uh, insurers and at the end of the day also um, the, um, the Dutch ministry to work with us and also to work with us as in changing some of the uh, more difficult uh, uh, challenges to change within the system. Which leads me to the, uh, to the final innovative feature, which is f financial incentives. So based on uh, some of the success we had, uh, we were able to convince uh, the ministry that, uh, that they had to pilot bundled payments. And um, by um, uh, piloting with this new financial uh, regime, we were also able um, <clears throat> for the primary care physicians uh, to even take on more um, 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 uh, authority, so to say, within the healthcare system. So, and that is where Zio, um, I think, found its uh, its origin. Because Zio nowadays, it's a it's an independent organisation made up of already existing uh, healthcare um, uh, primary care physicians. So, it's a it's a new organisation. It has uh, it has an uh, um, an independent status, uh, and it is able to contract with the health insurance company and also, also to subcontract with other healthcare uh, professionals. So nowadays, uh, Zio, and we have uh, around 100 of these kind of organizations throughout the country, uh, they make a very strong um, organization who do work with hospitals, uh, they collaborate with hospitals, 
but uh, I think they, they take away uh, a lot of the uh, burden which used to be with the physicians in the hospitals and ending up treating, pe uh, treating uh, 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 people within primary healthcare settings and no longer within the hospitals. Uh, finally, I think um, what is important to stress is leadership. Uh, I think from the early stages on, we had people uh, with, uh, with a great vision and who had the courage to, to actually do things in a different way. And that wasn't always very easy. So we, we got criticized a lot of time. Um, we were, uh, I think, um, uh, lucky or able to show that, uh, you know, uh, going through this journey, we were able to show some of the uh, successes, but we were all, always very critical as on also sh showcasing the things which didn't work well and then coming up with uh, uh, p potential s solutions. I want to thank you all for your introductory comments, and obviously there's a, a lot we could talk about. I'd like to go through... Uh, uh, a few questions with you dealing with, uh, first of all, the, the policy side of this, uh, uh, your interactions with policymakers to enable these reforms to succeed, and then a bit more depth on some of the organizational changes that you implemented and supported to, uh, to get there. But you all should feel free to, to take this discussion in any direction that you think would be most helpful. I guess what I was struck by particularly was how all of these models, even though they included significant reforms in financing and, and regulations and other government policies, they all seem to be inspired by a different vision of care. So uh, in many of the healthcare reform efforts we've implemented here, it typically starts in a different way, that you know, costs are high, quality is low, and we need to you know, incentivize uh, uh, providers differently. Uh, you all seem to have taken a kind of a different approach, um, more starting with the vision of care that you'd like to achieve and then viewing the policy changes as aligning uh, with that vision. So it's a, a view, I think, that um, makes the providers involved um, feel like this is driven first and foremost by the goal of getting really good care for patients at a, at a low cost. Um, I'm wondering if you all could comment on how, how it happened in each of the countries that you're dealing with, that you're able to get the policymakers to take this new approach uh, and do it in a way that brought along uh, the, the providers in the community in some ways at the same time. Uh, if anybody wants to comment on that. Sure, I can, I can, I can start on that. Um, I, I think it's, it's, a, it's a great question. Um, you know, in the, in the, uh, in, the, in the Nepal context, we, um, we, we, we started out uh, in our discussions with the, the government really coming from the perspective of the rural health care uh, provider. So our, um, our uh, midwives and general practitioner doctors and, and uh, health assistants and community medical assistants, these various tiers of uh, providers. Um, and we, we started by um, w developing an arrangement with the government to provide comprehensive primary and secondary care and, um, and then uh, and, and taking certain aspects that are in existing policy, and, uh, such as the, the allocation of certain uh, providers in, for, uh, to, to rural areas and certain uh, financing mechanisms that they already had. Um, and then uh, I, really I, working with the government to allow us to have some flexibility in what we do uh, to bring forth um, innovations that, that were not quite yet in policy, um, as well as identifying areas where the government has had a stated uh, objective of, um, of implementing something but had yet to succeed in implementing something. So in the, in, in the national health uh, sectors, the five-year plan that the government had put together, they they mentioned, you know, sort of in response largely to kind of global dialogue around this, they mentioned priorities around a new version of community health workers, around uh, a, a digitization of health care, around a provision of care for chronic diseases and mental health, even around quality improvement. Um, and yet there, in the pure government system, there had really been very, almost uh, zero uh, actual implementation of these initiatives. And so we identified um, 
areas where the government had actually had stated policies but weren't implementing them and then worked with uh, government officials at, a, at a, both a, a central and local level to implement them. Um, but I, I think the, the key feature of this and why I, I think Mark so pro and his team so appropriately put the provider organization at the top of the pyramid is that if you're really interested in accountability, it has to be uh, at, a, at a very local level uh, where, uh, where providers are able to respond to the needs of their patients and the needs of, um, of other uh, stakeholders in, in uh, the, the local community, be they, they elected officials um, or other community organizations. Um, and so that's something that we've really tried to work in and in, in cultivate with our leadership at the, at the hospital and community, community level um, and uh, in, in the very functioning of the, the boards that govern these hospitals uh, where they are um, they're responsive to the, the sort of set of global ideas around ideas like accountable care, but ultimately they, the accountability mechanisms flow at a, at, at a local level. Okay, so concerning policy, um, so go, to go back uh, in the history, the um, Optimedis AG I'm now working for is coming out of a healthcare consultancy company. And um, we try to bring policymakers, um, or bring these ideas to policymakers early on. And then we, when we got the chance and uh, this law changed and uh, organizations like us were possible, then we said, okay, now it's the chance, now we have to do that. And um, the first law that allowed us also had one significant uh, uh, financial incentive in there. So sickness funds were allowed to use 1% of their payments to hospitals, to physicians, for integrated care contracts like ours. And so they had the incentive either, they spent the 1% um, as always, uh, traditionally for hospitals, physicians and so on, or they take this 1% out and can use it for something new. And that's why a lot of them said, okay, I can use this for something new, let's try it. And this allowed us to start. And from that on, we were working a lot on, we did a lot of publications. We um, are in a lot of um, um, boards from, uh, um, that are working on managed care in Germany who are promoting this idea. And um, we, we also, from the start, said we want to have an external evaluation. We don't want only to have our data and show it uh, to the public, but we want to have it externally so that there's an independent evaluation that shows if it's working or not. And from that, we then can argue with policymakers um, to take the next steps. And um, also, right now, um, in January, one new model uh, accountable care model, model in, in Germany started. That's the second time financed out of um, an initiative uh, from policymakers. It's called the Innovation Fund in Germany. Because um, after four years, this first incentive stopped, and then there are no new, um, no new networks and no new accountable care organizations in Germany were rising because nobody had the investment to start it. In Germany, you don't have these big organizations like here, like HMOs, who have the possibility to build such an ACO out of their own business. So you need some kind of investment. And for that, we were promoting an innovation fund, so where um, money from the government is used to push such new models, and we got another model that is financed now out of that. And the third thing we are now working on is um, if, and we can't finance our scaling up just out of this uh, government starting money, so now we are speaking with uh, social impact funds who wants to bring uh, a return on investment plus also a social impact. And that's perfect for our model because we can deliver both. Thanks, Mark. Um, <clears throat> I can make uh, the story much more pretty as it is, but I think in, in the Netherlands, um, I do think it, it started with a vision of the late Minister Els Borst, 
who was advised by a think tank in the Netherlands um, <clears throat> to address the, uh, the increasing challenge of, uh, of the number of people with chronic conditions. And this was back in the, in the late 80s, early 90s. <clears throat> so the, the government was aware that, uh, that they had to come up with, uh, with different uh, um, uh, uh, models, or they had to st stimulate uh, the field to come up with, uh, with uh, innovative uh, ideas, how to address the, the increasing number of people with chronic conditions. Uh, and that is, I think, where uh, Maastricht got um, the opportunity to actually um, start with, um, with some, uh, some research as in to um, evaluate uh, the involvement of nurses uh, taking care of people with chronic conditions. And uh, working on that project, uh, we were able to present the results to the ministry, and we were then also advising the uh, the ministry as in what we thought were the, uh, should be the next steps. So from working with nurses, we moved on to strengthening uh, the primary care organization as in um, the development of care groups, and ZEO, uh, as I said, is one of those care groups. And uh, after the establishment of the care groups, we worked on, on uh, care standards, um, which are uh, documents which are adopted by uh, the main players within Dutch healthcare, uh, who, uh, who uh, within that standard, a document who agree on, um, you know, some of the, uh, the important indicators to, to achieve and, and how that should be achieved. And these care standards were then the base, base for, um, for bundled payments. So it was a kind of a, uh, an, 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 um, it's, it started all with one study and then, you know, it, it based on that study, uh, and this study, obviously it was not just uh, performed in, in, the, in the Maastricht region. There were uh, uh, also other sites who contributed that within the Netherlands. But that's actually how it started, and then uh, it, it, uh, it led to, uh, to different uh, developments. And we, we kept this relationship with, with, the, uh, with the ministry, uh, obviously. So we also had the opportunity to work with um, uh, people at the ministry. So we invited them on a regular basis to come over, or uh, we, uh, as we, uh, I think, um, within the Netherlands uh, are not shy to do, we invited ourselves and to go to the, to, to the ministry and present our findings and told them that they had to, uh, you know, uh, either react or to be more proactive as in stimulating these kind of developments. Like a very constructive approach to uh, government engagement, and you also uh, answered, I think, the next question I was going to ask about, which is from a policymaker standpoint, you, you want to know if it works, and then you want to know whether and how it can be scaled. And, and I take from all of your previous answers that, that important to this was developing evidence uh, along the way, uh, having transparency, having independent evaluations, and that's something that every single one of you uh, emphasized in, in one way or another. That takes a, a bit of attention to infrastructure, uh, but it also helps make uh, uh, course adjustments possible, and I would think um, a, a lot of the benefit is not just uh, transparency around what these reforms and payment and, and care delivery are achieving, but also transparency and opportunities for learning for how other organizations could potentially succeed in this uh, in, in the same kind of uh, in the same kind of framework. Um, I, I do want to move on to some organizational issues, but one more policy question first. Um, in looking around the world, we've seen different kinds of accountable care models that are reflected in the same types of models emerging in the U.S. Uh, we have some models of accountable primary care that are moving in towards uh, a more holistic, uh, away from fever service approach to uh, delivering primary care services with some connection to uh, uh, overall cost. And, and, and outcome improvements, since uh, um, many of these reforms seem to put primary care at the middle uh, of, uh, of getting things done. Um, we've seen some interest in bundled payment reforms. The U.S. is implementing episode payments, uh, often in, in hospital-based conditions, but not exclusively, uh, including for uh, chronic conditions uh, like, uh, like diabetes. And then, obviously, there are a number of uh, accountable care organization approaches that are uh, really aiming for more uh, uh, comprehensive uh, uh, patient management within a, a single uh, financial arrangement. 
Um, you all have come at this from, from different angles. Uh, one of the questions that, that people in the U.S. are asking is, okay, all of these seem to have some successes, some failures, some, some considerable promise. Uh, do they fit together? Uh, um, what, what, what's your sense about uh, um, uh, uh, driving payment reform? Yeah, Bert. Yeah, if I can, if I can take this one. Uh, yeah, I think they do fit together. It's uh, as I said in, in in the beginning. It's a really complex challenge. So it's it's not just uh, a a, a, a one-way kind of solution. So uh, yeah, uh, I think. Uh, 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 as in the organization, organization or the organization has to be, um, well, at the end of the day, um, we have to collaborate. So if collaboration means that organizations have to uh, change some of the, um, you know, the way they work together, then th that requires organizational integration. Uh, but if you start uh, changing organizations, then uh, at, at the same time, uh, you start touching upon the financial incentives, right? Because at the end of the day, uh, organizations, they, they have this um, uh, will to survive as they are. Uh, or uh, if they are really innovative, they will uh, probably change their complete direction and, and, and look for, uh, for a new way how to... Uh, make things work, but uh, I haven't seen that happening um, 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 from the established organizations within healthcare that often. And um, primary care, I think that that makes a difference um, uh, uh, between healthcare systems. So uh, the Netherlands has historically a very strong um, primary healthcare system. So it was uh, it was a no-brainer, I think, within the Netherlands to kind of build upon that fundament within the healthcare system and even uh, make primary, primary health care more strong. But if you think about uh, the challenges of people with chronic conditions, uh, also within systems uh, who uh, historically do not have such a strong primary care uh, sector. So I've been uh, in, in Singapore, uh, working in Singapore for the last five years, and I think Singapore, with that respect, looks a lot like the US, where uh, primary health care is, uh, you know, w where hospitals, I think, are the, uh, uh, are the, the more strong component of, of the healthcare system. Uh, I do see also uh, a lot of policies trying to strengthen primary care, uh, not just within Singapore, but also in the US. And I think that makes perfectly sense because at the end of the day, we would like to organize healthcare as close as possible to where people live, right? So that also uh, brings us to the shift from, uh, from healthcare to social care. So um, yeah, I think at the end of the day, coming back to your question, um, you may want to start from you know, one step, one direction, but at the end of the day, you probably have to address all of these different uh, angles. Mm -hmm. Any other comments? Or? Um, so I also see it uh, like you, and uh, I see that this accountable care is really, it's a global movement. And um, I just remember when I first heard about accountable care organizations in the US, and um, maybe it was in 2011 or 2010, and um, when I was reading these CMS contracts and how they wanted to sign it, I thought, oh, that's what we are doing. And I don't think you ever heard about Kinzigtal before. Um, <laughs> well, we're, we're you, changing that now. So, yeah. <laughs> so um, it was very interesting that some of the core concepts were uh, going on in the US as well as in Germany, and we are now uh, also speaking with partners in Belgium, in the Netherlands, in the UK, and these are all totally different systems. But the idea that you need accountability for a population and that you some kind of pool of shared savings or payment system who rewards that into place is one that's, uh, that's needed now with all these chronic conditions and things going on that need more integration than before when we just tried to repair uh, in, in the healthcare system. I was just going to say that um, you know, I definitely think that these pieces fit together and part of being in an accountable care organization and is uh, developing relationships with the government to kind of work together towards that, the sort of broader vision um, as, you're, as you're developing trust in each other and, and it, you really can't understate the importance of trust between providers and the, and the payers and the and their patients and and ultimately the government um, and in, in our case we we've really pushed a lot of the accountable care type um, 
uh, delivery mechanisms uh, out in front of the payment model. So in, in Nepal, before when we started, really the only way that the government was invent investing in non-state entities was through um, building hospitals or building buildings or, or paying for an, an X-ray machine. And we've been really trying to shift the government away from that. Um, and even as we've been piloting a national health insurance program with the, with the government, it's a fee-for-service program. It's not, it, it's, we were willing to kind of, we acknowledge that we have to compromise on on some of these elements to to move forward um, the other the whole the overall objective of of global accountable uh, care. Yeah, and I think that that point about taking account of uh, the the political realities in a place where our system is is uh, uh, is very important, and and you all have done that in 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 your respective situations. I do want to get to one um, question on the organizational side. I think uh, either. In your comments this morning, and certainly in the discussions that we had in the case study analysis, you all mentioned the word integration or, or integrator in, in one way or another, where um, to, 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 to overly simplify, a common feature has been providing some additional organizational support infrastructure on top of the existing provider system. So you haven't uh, necessarily replaced uh, all of the uh, physicians uh, that are working with you and other health practitioners, uh, but in the case of um, uh, uh, GK, uh, some infrastructure support around helping them um, uh, operate more as a team, doing population management, in the case of Zio, um, some support for, for you know, very small practices, you know, just, a, just a few doctors uh, who may not have had much uh, uh, view that they had the capacity to do this kind of population management. Um, any specific lessons about how to bring the physicians and other health professionals along as you do this so they view you uh, really as complementary and not as a threat? Okay, so maybe I can start. So. Um, from the first day on, it was clear that uh, we had to make, um, to show them what our responsibilities can be and what theirs are. They bring to the table that they know exactly about the, um, the healthcare and about how it's run in the region. They have the medical know-how and that's what they bring to the table. What they needed from us were, were organizational management skills and health economic skills. So we organized for them, for example, the electronic health record. They don't have the time to think about these strategic things and how can you bring an electronic health record that's interconnected into the system. This has to be organized by us, and they were happy that we are doing that. Or things like um, for the payment. We try to make it as easy as possible for them and help them in all kinds of things so that they can concentrate on their medical know-how and on their uh, provision of care to the patients. And also um, we implemented a big feedback systems um, and also there it was, we bring the data and we bring the technology so they can get their feedback um, reports, but we don't say this is right or that is right. We discuss the measures with them, we bring them to the quality circles they are working on, and then they discuss what's going on. And I think that's the, the big uh, differentiation. Um, <clears throat> integration is uh, it's, it's, it's an activity, right? And you have to integrate when, um, um, when the system is is fragmented, uh, at least that's what we that we tend tend to think. Uh, but um, you have various phases of integration, and I think we we haven't reached that that final. Well, we certainly haven't reached that final level yet. And and um, integration, I think, also refers to different dimensions. So um, we often talk about organizational integration as as that is what integration is all about. But uh, I can easily, uh, uh, you know, mention another seven or eight dimensions, which all have to fit together. So it's it's a jigsaw of uh, not just organizational integration, but also financial integration or um, uh, cultural integration. Right? If you start. Uh, um, um, making connections between organizations, if that is your first step towards a, a full integration, then you have to accept that, uh, you know, 
the different cultures yeah. between the organizations that also ha uh, they also have to co you also have to bring them together so um, um, Organizational integration is definitely on the radar uh, of, of a lot of the uh, changes within the Netherlands, uh, but I think we are happy to say that nowadays uh, the agenda of integration uh, is a much broader one, uh, but has also become even more uh, complicated these days. So it's not just about the organizational integration anymore. And it, it, it also refers to what I just mentioned. Uh, you know, it's healthcare, social care. So, you know, we're moving from patients to persons. So that, that brings in uh, entire different dimensions to the discussion. Um, so as, as far as data, as far as integration of uh, various clinical components as it relates to provider behavior and uh, sort of mindset change, uh, for us, a, a paradigmatic example of this was in the rollout of, the, of our uh, integrated electronic medical record, which was the first in, in the Nepal context. Um, and we had to, I think the two main drivers that, uh, and, or really the three main drivers of, of, of uh, why we were, have been successful in doing that, um, one, the, the providers saw the, um, the benefit, uh, the, the time savings of using electronic micro record for the, cur the current paper-based government reporting system, which is, is just, it, it's an enormous burden on, on providers. So they were able to see that, uh, that time savings benefit. Two, for a, a lot of the mid-level um, and even physician providers in, in rural Nepal, they've, they've, they don't have, they see being able to utilize a computer and, and be able to use an electronic medical record as being, as being part of a, of a 21st century healthcare professional, and, and, um, and, they, and they, they value that. And so that, that was, that's, we've really relied upon that. And then finally, um, the integrating of, integration of, of clinical systems with data systems uh, showing to the providers in in real time that you that the data that they're that that they're generating via an electronic micro, medical record can actually feed back to their performance. So we developed a, a, a dashboard whereby um, during the physicians at the the main teaching hospitals they, at the they during their uh, morning. Um, medical ed education rounds, they're able to, pr to, to pull up what uh, basic information about the number of children that were screened for malnutrition the, the previous day, um, the number of chronic disease patients who actually had a diagnosis via, via the electronic medical record, um, and the, the, the time it took for patients to go through the, the entire process of care from registration to being seen in, in the outpatient department to getting a lab, to getting an x-ray, to getting a pharmacy. Um, and in our context, this is very important because uh, patients often walk five, six, ten hours a day to get to, to care, and then they, uh, and then they stay, they literally stay at the hospital all day awaiting for fairly rudimentary evaluations. Yeah, I'd say this um, practical focus on making information technology really useful from the start, uh, maybe not doing everything, but then building it out, um, made possible by these financial arrangements is really distinctive. I, I'd say it's a, a feature of all uh, the cases we've seen, a very important approach, and I think a lot of lessons there for the U.S. Um, we have a few minutes for uh, comments or questions from those of you here or online. Uh, any uh, uh, questions? Uh, Victor, you want uh, thank you very much for three uh, excellent models of accountable care, and there's a lot of common themes. My question for you, uh, many of you have been around for eight years or longer, right? So the question of pace and scale remains to be an issue anywhere, you know, for our, for our country in any model, and therefore for you in terms of how you believe that in Netherlands or in Germany or in Nepal, whether your models can be broadly adopted because it's so successful and how to do that. So in other words, what are your challenges and what is the pace by which you can imagine this can go? Because if successful, you can greatly improve care and reduce costs. Uh, great question. It's asked to keep the answers brief. <laughs> Uh, well, I'd, I'd say in, in, our con in any context, you, you really have to look at the, the institutional assets and liabilities. And I, and I think for us, when we think about scale, um, we, really, uh, we, we've, we've really relied initially on 
um, sort of, there were so many areas of accountable care innovations that needed to happen at a very local level that we need to iterate on before really pushing forward scale. And in fact, in the case of digitization, this has become a major priority of the government, the gov and we've provided the government with, uh, we've actually helped to establish an e-health unit, um, which had not existed, and to establish uh, e-health standards based on our, our deployment of, of, a, of an open source electronic medical record. Um, in that, and then the government is now saying, let's, let's go scale this up. And you have to be, in, in, our, in this instance, we actually are interested in actually slowing back the scale of, uh, uh, slowing back the pace of scale because um, we, don't, we see real gaps in implementation capacity. So I think that for, for us, in many cases, it's actually sort of saying, well, you know, change, change isn't going to happen overnight, um, and this is a lifelong, multi-generational endeavor of creating complex, adaptive learning healthcare systems. Um, and so we've had to, to, at times, scale back our own ambitions and that of the government uh, it, when we think about scale. Okay, so I would say the, there were three main challenges for scaling up. First thing was uh, we needed evidence, and to produce evidence we need time, because uh, to see these effects it took some time. Then, then when we had the evidence, the next thing was the Bayer side. So we had no problems to get uh, physicians uh, interested for these models, but the Bayer mindset, uh, especially in Germany, was not that uh, yeah, progressive. So this. Uh, this uh, first model we started, there was a really progressive CEO, and he said, okay, let's do that. I want, I think it's a good idea, just let's go for it. If there are any uh, problems on the way, we will find a way to get rid of them. The rest, or a lot of uh, insurance companies in Germany, are very risk-oriented. So they just see what is the risk and not what are the chances. And we needed this investment from them for the first three years, so most of them said, okay, let's wait a little bit. And so, and the third thing is the investment, the challenge that you need investment for the first three years, in our case, until you reach a break even. And if uh, you don't get on the one side the payer, the insurance companies, to get this investment into the system, then you need some kind of venture capital. And our model at the beginning, also because there was not enough evidence, but it's also not the mindset of a venture capital person. And so it was hard to convince them. Now we have with the social impact funds, they are more on our mindset, and uh, we see some uh, possibilities there. Do you want to get to one more question? Yeah, and then... Uh, um, I'm Susan Mendy from Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and we look at um, adapting global lessons to the U.S., so thank you. I'm wondering um, whether or not any of your systems that where the healthcare delivery system is actually investing in or partnering with other systems that impact social determinants of health, such as housing or transportation, has that, uh, have, have those crossed um, sectors yet in, in this work? Yeah, um, <clears throat> within the Netherlands, I, I do think we see some of the some of the first initiatives in in in, it, in that area. So, uh, and that I think relates to the discussion about you know uh, the challenge of chronic diseases, uh, um, bringing together healthcare and social care as well as housing and, and transportation. So, uh, um, I think. Um, um, the, there is the, uh, the vision exists on a, a national level, but you see the most interesting uh, initiatives on a local level. So it also depends on the vision of the leaders of the, the, the local uh, care groups, uh, of which ZEO is one. Uh, if they make the connections uh, with the uh, local policymakers and the local players, then you see these very, uh, very interesting initiatives. So some of the first ones are indeed uh, uh, also uh, evaluated and studied. So we even see some of the first results of in, within this area. But it's only very small scale at, at this at this very. Uh, so it's it's very early stage, I would say. Um, yes, for us also these um, social issues are a big thing we are working on and um, as we look at the regional level we also working closely with the mayors in this area and we are organizing like uh, festivities where we bring the people together and look at health 
and um, also get all the yeah the the clubs and uh, things that are in the area together. Just for example, things like to uh, to connect elderly people and let them cook together so that they have social um, they they have uh, they are back in the social life and things like that. Uh, they are small scale, and, and we don't have to invest a lot. We just have to uh, look where are people who are working on these issues and how can we connect them and steer uh, our injuries into these uh, services. Well, I'd like to thank all of our panelists for uh, an excellent discussion of some complex topics. Uh, certainly everything I heard uh, has resonance here in the United States. Uh, I wish this were easier, but it sure is helpful to have lots of examples and lots of experiences and therefore lots of insights in the best way to succeed and, and scale effective accountable care reforms. Uh, we're going to come back to this in the, the next session, but right now I'd like to thank our panelists for traveling here and uh, presenting their experiences so effectively. Thank you all very much. And now we're going to take a very brief break while we reset uh, the, the second panel. Uh, feel free to stretch your legs, uh, step out for a minute, but just a minute.
Good morning. We're going to restart in just a minute, so if I could ask our next panel up to the podium. Great. Welcome back. Following that fantastic conversation that gave us a very broad perspective on what's happening in very different health contexts in different parts of the world and how we can learn from all of them, we're now going to transition a bit to bring it into the U.S. perspective. And to do that, we have key stakeholders representing multiple perspectives here in the U.S. I will start with some quick introductions, and then we'll go straight into a panel discussion. First, uh, to my left, we've got uh, Dr. Jonathan Perlin, who serves as President of Clinical Services and is the Chief Medical Officer of Nashville, Tennessee-based HCA, where he provides leadership for clinical services and improvement per of performance at 167 hospitals and more than 1,000 outpatient surgical, urgent care, and other practice units. Before joining HCA, he served as Undersecretary for Health of the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs. Nominated by the President and confirmed by the Senate, he was the senior most physician in the federal government and chief executive officer of the Veterans Health Administration, where he led the nation's largest integrated health system. He has also served as chairman of the American Hospital Association and inaugural chair of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Health IT Standards Committee. Next to John, we've got Dr. Mai Pham. Dr. Pham is a general internist who provided primary care at safety net organizations for many years. Uh, she now is part of our team at Duke Margola Center for Health Policy, uh, and prior to that, she served as Chief Innovation Officer at the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, where she was responsible for implementation of the alternative payment model provisions of the Medicare and CHIP Reauthorization Act and other cross-cutting initiatives for the center. She also was previously Director of the Seamless Care Models Group at CMMI, where she oversaw the design and testing of models of accountable care organizations and advanced primary care, including the Pioneer and Next Generation ACO models, the Comprehensive Primary Care Initiative, and the Comprehensive ESRD Care Initiative. And finally, uh, at the end, we've got Dr. Victor Zhao, who is president of the National Academy of Medicine, formerly the Institute of Medicine. He also serves as the chair of the Health and Medicine Division Committee of the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine, and vice chair of the National Research Council. Dr. Zhao was also Chancellor Emeritus and James B. Duke Professor of Medicine at Duke University and past President and CEO of the Duke University Health System. And he has previously held the positions of the Hersey Professor of Theory and Practice of Medicine and Chairman of Medicine at Harvard Medical School's Brigham and Women's Hospital, as well as Chairman of the Department of Medicine at Stanford University. So we're very pleased to have this esteemed panel with multiple perspectives. And to get us started, I'd like to uh, just throw open a, a question for each of you to consider, which is really you've uh, not only been here this morning to hear from um, some of the models, but had a chance to, to read more about them and served on our advisory board as we've gone down this journey and across that experience. Um, would like to get your initial reactions from what you've heard, what you've seen, and what you've read. Um, how do we go about thinking about the lessons learned from the international perspective for the U.S.? What do you think those key learnings have been, and and what surprised you, if anything, along the way? So let me, maybe let me start with John. Well, good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to be here. And uh, let me congratulate uh, each program on your remarkable uh, achievement. I believe you really serve as international reference points, beacons, really, of uh, progress and uh, and hope. Uh, thanks also, Krishna, to you, Mark, the Duke Margolis um, uh, Center, as well as the Commonwealth Fund, for really creating this opportunity for just terrific cross-cultural learning. I think we're here today unified by a desire for better health, better care at, uh, at lower cost. And uh, I know that it may be tempting for um, perhaps our policymakers to think that nothing uh, applies, but uh, the truth is that there's tremendous amount to learn. Uh, there is this issue, though, of cultural relativism. I always, um, and through the Commonwealth Fund, uh, uh, and uh, thank Robin Osborne for the opportunities at Penny Hill Park, uh, but, um, you know, sometimes it would be tempting to invoke the um, George Bernard Shaw uh, quip that um, uh, sometimes we were two cultures separated by a common language. Uh, and indeed, um, sometimes it may feel that way, but um, it's really an understanding 
the cultural differences that I think some of the structural uh, innovations can really find their foothold uh, in our um, uh, environment uh, for um, uh, innovation uh, and improvement. It's been interesting this morning. We haven't uh, mentioned, um, uh, you know, sort of the elephant in the room, which is that um, there is a different philosophy uh, in terms of uh, health services than the last uh, administration. Uh, let the record show I am an optimist, and I think um, that um, uh, there may be opportunities, but perhaps at a different level. Uh, as we think about the U.S. context and the opportunity for uh, innovation, uh, perhaps it occurs at the state level. If indeed there are such things as Medicaid block grants, uh, then what an extraordinary opportunity for some of these programs uh, in terms of the mechanism of unifying um, risk stratification of at-risk population uh, and connection to more integrated um, uh, delivery mechanisms that um, support uh, social uh, and, uh, and social determinant um, uh, issues uh, as well as the care delivery. Um, as well, I think there's also an opportunity for expanded physician roles uh, in uh, care management governance, uh, as was um, offered to us in the Gazindes uh, example, uh, particularly um, with the uh, new um, uh, Secretary of Health and Human Services um, uh, being uh, a physician uh, and some of the uh, approaches he's expressed. So that leads to the question of what generalizes. Um, I, I think the, um, uh, the vision um, uh, generalizes for better care, uh, improved health uh, at, at lower cost. Uh, and um, I, I think what I take away from it is that these examples took the world as it is. They didn't say, let's recreate everything, then begin. They took the world as it was and used that as an effective starting point. I think that's um, you know, an example of why bundles have um, the opportunity for such success, because uh, they, in fact, um, latch on to the mechanisms that are in place, but change the context of uh, accountability. I think the other thing that I heard in these um, terrific examples were um, that there was support for transformation, uh, not just the ultimate destination. I'm going to come back to this point because I think there are two parallel tasks in these innovative uh, models. One is a vision uh, that's the destination. The other is what pieces need to come into play to actually get there. What sorts of things um, generalize at um, a more fundamental level? Broad sets of measures of addressing care itself, the quality of life, uh, which expands some of the measures in the patient centricity or person centricity uh, as, as well. Um, obviously, cost, the, the um, focus not just on care measures, but also measures of, of population uh, health. Um, I think that person, not just patient centricity, uh, was particularly important, and indeed the case studies bring out that that relates to uh, a population health um, uh, perspective. Uh, and that risk assessment uh, as a fundamental really allows um, in what industrial um, uh, engineers would call load management. Why not distribute the workload amongst what have been hitherto non-traditional providers? And uh, I think that's something uh, that has uh, immediate um, uh, salience uh, in terms of um, the clinical and financial integration uh, that um, uh, is a part of both the integration of the health delivery reform with the payment reform. I think the support systems for frontline workers, as demonstrated by the electronic health records in Gazundas and the Nepal uh, EHR Light uh, experience, are, are um, uh, great examples of that. Um, preserving or even elevating the clinical autonomy of the frontline while deburdening some of the administrative aspect, I, I think, is also a, a policy um, a opportunity uh, that um, uh, translates well. Um, political awareness. Political awareness really was the key to the politics and the policy that was facilitating in terms of legislation and regulation uh, that created, um, for example, the bandwidth for changing provider roles. Uh, that's certainly an opportunity here. We speak of team-based care, uh, yet we don't have environments where practitioners practice at top of license, save for uh, some notable examples. Recently, the VA expanded scope of practice, and uh, you know I think we should think of VA uh, not only as a service delivery, but in a sense uh, a nation within a nation in terms of uh, some of the policy uh, opportunities. The, the other reality is that, uh, look, the health services research is pretty clear. Advanced practice nurses and um, doctorally trained pharmacists actually do as well as, as uh, if not better, than physicians, glucose management, anticoagulation control, and uh, lipid management. So why wouldn't we do that? 
I think the context that was also um, uh, brought up, and Victor, I, I hope you'll comment on it, really this concept of learning healthcare, that these are self-rectifying systems. They use the data that are a product of their own care to improve, improve and inform and even create an evidence base to facilitate the expansion of the program itself. Uh, if those are the um, uh, opportunities, then, what are, what are some of the challenges? Uh, I think we're really stuck in the United States in terms of not taking the long perspective. You heard that in Gazindas, um, they took a 10-year uh, perspective, and the ZEO really started in the 90s. I don't know if everyone in this room realizes it, but the Congressional Budget Office only scores uh, legislation in terms of the one-year return. And for social intervention, for preventive health, that's a really tough frame to get return on investment. Uh, I thought um, in terms of advancing uh, cultural integration and the comments that were made about needing to build the trust of providers, both the institutions and individuals, Gunasundas again and Zio uh, brought that out, uh, are also um, parallel trans uh, uh, challenges in our context. Uh, leadership uh, for the long haul, as Zio mentioned, uh, really needs to um, uh, be there uh, across political administrations in a country uh, and across, frankly, the turbulence of the transitional innovations themselves. Um, I, I think, fourth, the, the role of evidence. Um, to, um, you know, I think uh, we're having some debate about that, but ultimately, uh, we as health services researchers believe in evidence-based medicine. We also need to believe in evidence-based um, management. And ZEO used that evidence to demonstrate and support the, the, the role of uh, advanced practice um, uh, nurses and nurses in providing that com uh, community care. And finally, um, uh, vision. You know, vision alone may not be enough to transcend history, uh, even if it's compelling. Um, you may need incentives. Uh, incentives to overcome, as Zio mentioned, the inertia. Organizations tend to perpetuate themselves uh, in their own image. Uh, and changing an organization requires perhaps some change in incentives to create um, uh, the activation energy to overcome uh, that inertia. Second, um, the cultural transformation. I thought it was really interesting, the framing that the EHR <clears throat> in Nepal wasn't just for um, uh, the communication of information, but rather it allowed the, the practitioners to feel uh, empowered, professional, contemporary. Uh, and a lesson I learned uh, at VA is that performance measures at one blush, at first blush, can be felt as onerous and problematic. But you know what? When you do really well, they're validating. I believe I heard that um, uh, in the terrific um, uh, comments about the Nepal experience. And then finally, I'll, I'll close with the, the last comment. I had the privilege of serving um, in 2015 as the chair of the American Hospital Association and sort of viewing 5,500 hospitals and health systems um, uh, experience with, with, with transformation. Uh, and um, indeed, one needs a compelling destination. One needs a payment reform model that supports that health delivery reform. But the challenge I think we as a country need to better articulate, better focus on, and better develop uh, is really a support pathway for the transformation itself. Uh, it's uh, a really schizophrenic time. There's a lot of ambiguity, and it's really difficult to have a foot uh, in one payment model and another foot in another payment model. Uh, I, I think um, I, I equipped and it took some traction uh, that um, transformation would occur as one foot on the boat, one foot on the dock, with weight shifting to the boat sailing off into that world. Uh, but in point of fact, the most tenuous time is that intermediate, that testing of weight, uh, and um, that's a sustained period of time. Uh, and in each of these models, one of the things I'd like to, like to learn more about is really how one supported uh, from um, uh, the origin uh, to the destination, the successful uh, uh, transformation while maintaining the financial viability. United States, um, you know, there are two-thirds of hospitals that either operate with zero or negative margin. Uh, and um, it's not a reticence for improved health services delivery. It is a reticence to crash in the transition process. And um, I, I think there's a great deal of insight that can be garnered from these um, international models. Thanks. Great. Thank you, John. That was a fantastic, comprehensive perspective, and I think you've laid out some, some issues that we'll unpack over the next few minutes. Let me turn now to Mai. Thanks, Krishna, and uh, thank you to the Commonwealth Fund and um, Duke for having me at Duke <laughs> as well as here. Um, uh, I won't repeat a lot of what Jonathan said that I wholeheartedly agree with, but I, I will try to take us a step back and confess that I was a little bit stumped in my assignment for this panel because I got quite hung up on the word translation. 
which to me implies retaining the precise meaning while conveyed in a different language. And I had a lot of trouble doing that from other country contexts into the U.S. So I fell back uh, on you know, more, more personal foils that I have that have gotten me through other aspects of my professional life. And one of those is like some of you know, not many, but my family is very into folk music and folk life culture. And um, when we think about the folk process and how we live it, it's really not a matter of translation when you learn new traditions or when you try to share your own. It's transmission um, because there's a temporal element, there's a distance element, there's this element of crossing borders, which is what we're trying to do here. And what transmission allows that translation sometimes feel a little bit inhibitory um, with regards to is the ability to make it your own and to feel that that's entirely legitimate, that you're, you're still honoring the tradition, but you're making it work in your context. So I reinterpreted my assignment as transmission, and from that perspective uh, into the U.S. context, some of the high-level takeaway themes that I gathered from these very um, creative models, and again, I will add my congratulations to those, uh, those teams, but also the other case studies that we read, um, that we could really learn from in terms of how we would transmit it here. First, that it begins with a whole community. And you can define that community in any of a number of ways, but it's not only that, that the community is the unit of intervention, but the community is actually the origin of the intervention. Um, the origin of the idealized care model, the origin of the very difficult, awkward conversations around how we're going to handle, in our context, the interests of multiple payers, of multiple employers, of, depending on the community that you're in, the various competitive narratives that have to be dealt with before you can think about co-creating this wholesale intervention and then engaging your policymakers to give you the flexibilities that you need to actually implement it. So this notion of the origin within a whole community, and I would urge us to think not just about states, but really what makes what makes for a cohesive cultural as well cultural community as well as in terms of the healthcare commerce of that community. So Philadelphia may not be um, nearly as cohesive a region for those of us who trained in Philadelphia and know how at war Temple is with Penn, but Perhaps all of Vermont could be a community. Perhaps Western Pennsylvania could be a community. There is a cohesiveness about the community identifying itself that I think is an important starting point for in all of these models. The second that, um, that Jonathan touched upon was this openness to long-term engagement. It need not be 10 years, but surely it can be more than one year for any of, for a whole broad range of reasons, not only that some of the returns we would hope to get from the investments we make, especially in addressing social determinants or preventive health care, take a longer time horizon, but also, frankly, change takes time. And investments of any kind take time to see returns. Cultural change takes time. Process change takes time. And we don't want to grade someone on results when we know that they're still working on process. That's just punitive um, and, and not constructive. So longer term engagement. Um, Part of the advantage of beginning with this cohesive whole community definition of both the problem and the unit of intervention is that then you can also have those cross-border conversations about removing the barriers between clinical and non-clinical services. Um, those are partnerships and conversations that are best had on the ground and not from a top-down perspective. You want to, it's something that you want to ask forgiveness for not permission, uh, and that if you walk into a policymaker's office cohered uh, and as, you know, as a unified community asking for these, these barriers to be removed, I think you'll be much more likely to be successful. Yet another reason that the whole community origin is important is something that I think many of these models took for granted, but that as the, um, as the patient attribution geek 
uh, at the agency that I just left, I cannot, which is the notion of patient attribution and deciding who is responsible for whom. When you have the whole community conversation, you can try to settle that up front. You can say, here are, our bound here are our borders, and when you come into these borders, you are a part of this experiment, and here's where you are not. There may be few exceptions. Um, but you, know, you all may take it for granted that there is some sort of enrollment, be it voluntary or mandatory, and that everybody knows who their doctor is. That is not the reality in our context. And to have those explicit conversations up front, uh, I think, would be an important part of this transmission. Um, and then for sure, building from that whole community approach, getting either your single payer, if you are so lucky, um, or multiple payers together to settle up front what who individual roles will be, what respective investments will look like um, while not crossing anti any antitrust lines um, is another really important foundational step. Um, and then, you know, so perhaps surprising to many of you who know that uh, I spent a lot of my time thinking about financial incentives and how to structure them and the importance of the payment model. I do think that's important here, but I, I think it's quite secondary to all of these other points. I think what we can learn about structuring financial incentives from these models when we transmit it here has to do with the humility of acknowledging that Clinicians, whomever it is whose behavior you're hoping to change with the incentives, they are very, very complicated creatures. They have many layers of motivations, um, and therefore there are many potential levers that you can push. And that if you try to impose a simplified financial structure of simply capitation or simply fee-for-service or even the combination of the two, you have missed a wealth of opportunity in terms of other levers you can push. There are internal motivations, professionalism. There are motivations of competitiveness and wanting to look well relative to their peers. There are motivations related to their long-term financial horizons. I, I love the notion of an equity stake. So just being humble about what we can put on the table um, and not confining ourselves to the usual suspects in terms of tools there, I think, would be a really great a way to transmit some of these lessons learned. Um, and then nothing more to say about real-time data except yes. Um, but I would, I would push us a little bit to think of not just real-time data for purposes of feedback and performance reporting, but also to be nudgy, to use that real-time data to say poke poke the patient and say, hey, here are a few things you can do, or poke the patient's family to say, hey, here's how you can help, or poke the clinician to say, look, look what we saw. There's a blip here, or there's a dip here, and here's what you can do about it. Um, if we have the real-time data, which will be a heavy lift in our context, you might as well make the most of it and not leave any of it on the table. So I'll pause there. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Mike. <clears throat> And thank you, especially of reminding us of the importance of community and the grassroots perspective in, in thinking about systematic changes, and also uh, making the point that language matters. Even what we call, whether this is translation or adaptation or transmission, I think you're right that that, that leads to very different connotations among different groups. So thank you. Victor, you now serve as a, a leading policy advisor, and you've brought the perspective of leading a large academic health system. From those two hats, how, how do you approach this work? Well, first, I think this is a timely initiative. I think the, the uh, Commonwealth Fund and uh, Duke Margolis Center are putting together because, you know, let's face it, the elephant in the room is repeal and replace. And the question, what does this all mean? And I would say, look, you can think about coverage and insurance, but we still have to get to where we, our challenges are, which is rising cost, quality, and, uh, you know, increased burden. So this initiative, I think, is totally relevant in terms of the continued journey. As my colleague said, it's a long-term journey that we need to continue to take. So there's no question that as we address this, uh, I look at it from the following perspective. First of all, um, as you said, uh, actually looking at Duncan, back the base of Brigham, I founded the Division of Health Equity, and so great to see beyond just care delivery, you guys getting really into policies, et cetera, it's just been terrific. 
And of course, thinking as the last CEO of Duke Health System and being on the ground uh, facing all these issues and now, I think that many of the discussions you heard from uh, Jonathan and from Palma are totally relevant. Uh, at the Academy, we've been thinking a lot about this issue. And first, um, Mark and I co-chair an initiative called Vital Directions in Health and Healthcare. We have uh, convened 150 different experts to say, what should health and healthcare look like uh, in the future, in the, perhaps if I can use the word, post-Obama era? And because we were thinking whoever is going to be, you know, in the Washington leading, they will have to still look at the fundamental direction we need to go. And of those uh, initiatives, we have found three goals of that initiative, better health and well-being, high-value health care, and strong science and technology. Do you notice that one of our major goals is, in fact, high-value health care, but fed by strong science and technology and moving towards, in fact, uh, better health and well-being. So I think it's very clear that in that initiative, which is uh, Mark and Mike Levitt played an important role, the issue of value and the uh, issue of uh, continuing improvement in care uh, uh, provision is really important. So that's why I think accountable care is an important issue that you've heard so much talked about today. Now, I think what we can learn from our colleagues internationally is that uh, they've done really for eight, 10 years of different types of experiments. Even today that we look at ACOs in this country, it's not there yet. And in fact, if you look at only about a third actually was able to show some share savings. And so we have a lot to learn. And so this is the other um, experience I had actually with Krishnan and myself with McKinsey and working on Forum. We founded Innovation Healthcare. And there we actually studied and curated innovations and care delivery models, low cost, in many different countries and found that in fact there are really many lessons learned. And so I think learning from all of you has been just really important. And I think Commonwealth Fund had the foresight to say, let's put this together and see what we can learn. So what are we learning from this? Um, I feel that many of the issues already been discussed by my colleagues earlier. I would say that uh, Mark started the, uh, the uh, presentation with his uh, accountable care framework which I thought was critically important. And the question as we kind of plug in organization competency, accountable care policy, and environment, I see lots of different issues related to all those three. And I do think that context and environment is important because some of the things you're able to do is not easily done in this country. Being able to build from ground, I think, uh, uh, Herbert, you're the one who said that no, actually it was uh, Alexander says that there was a German uh, law that was just timing for them to be able to bring this in, in Nepal right after, you know, changing government. So the timing is right. I think we have to deal with a lot more complexity in this country. But nevertheless, I think that the policy environment, and you've highlighted some of the major issues in policy environment, the population that you look at, whether it's high risk or whatever, uh, the performance measurements that you have talked about, the continuous improvement, the payment incentive, and care coordination. I think what I've learned from all of you is some consistency in all these models that alignment, cultural, and shared vision is important. But while I think uh, Pam says incentive is not, as a doctor I say it is. And in fact, payment reform is quite important. And what you've done is you actually brought in a type of uh, payment reform, although you did it in a very careful way, you know, in the hybrid model, in the stepwise model, which I think is the key in terms of long-term journey uh, to, get, to get there. Measurements, I won't say, need to say more about this, and of course, ultimately, risk stratification. So I'd like to actually spend a few minutes thinking about your models and what I can learn. Um, I think, you know, we struggle a lot in terms of ACOs, and a lot of ACOs are, in fact, hospital health, health system based. And that probably, what you've taught us is that it's really in looking at a provider base, community base, 
as Palmer said, is really critically important because that is probably close to aligning with the patients and the need for outcomes. And so let's take possible. I think possible is a really interesting model because I live in North Carolina, and I can tell you that a lot of struggle with North Carolina has to do with the population in the rural areas, populations and the Medicaid populations, and how do you actually provide care. We've had debate after debate about uh, what kind of model do you, should you have. Should you bring in health maintenance organizations to manage it? Uh, health management organizations, should you actually continue managed, you know, by the Department of Health and Human Services? Or should hospitals, in fact, take risks for that? And when I learned about the possible model looking at this, it's really a matter of building, you know, leveraging resources and building from the ground, particularly in health, uh, community health workers, who's doing so much of this. This is a task shifting issue that's been said many times. But also the ability to work with, say, a payment system that looks at the whole idea that we're going to manage a population and to use a hub and spoke model of network of community health workers and uh, technology like telehealth services. There's a lot of lessons that can be learned there, in my opinion. And, uh, and those lessons certainly would leverage the kind of things that we look at uh, in our countries, you know, using community health workers to go to remote areas, to continue connect with them uh, continuously, to use uh, telemedicine as a way, and to collect really good data from the community, and ultimately to look at uh, um, key performance ind indicators that include equity, which I found interesting, uh, institutional birth and conceptive prevalence. So the measurements do matter. I think that certainly a model like this could be adopted in the United States. When I think about North Carolina, we have an organization called the uh, CCNC, the Community Care of North Carolina, which actually had elements of this that brings together providers, uh, social workers, hospitals together. And perhaps if one look at how to even task shift more to rural areas and create the right model, it would be you know, really great. But I also learned a lot about, uh, from uh, Gunsidis Kinsektor because it is an interesting model that looks at physician ownership. So maybe more of the kind of physician-led ACOs and also looks at rural population. That is the idea that it's a joint venture. So certainly when I was at Duke, we thought about creating joint ventures. But this joint venture is interesting in that it does it with a health man management organization. So it has a payment, has shared savings, but also pay fee for service. And then at the same time, it allows you to look at share savings. And being a shareholder, the physicians, and I do think that matters, payment, uh, they have more incentive to say, if the system does well, I get a piece back. So I think that's another great lesson to be learned, in my opinion, of how to align the incentives. And finally, Zio, I think, is also fascinating in terms of risk stratification, looking at high-risk patients, and being able to use uh, bundle approaches, and also looking at uh, tools, as they say, to stratify patients, and also task shifting. So where does this all lead me? <clears throat> um, I think for sure, uh, I asked a question about scale and barriers, because in, in my own experience, there are certainly many successful experiments. And it's going to take some time, it's been said, to, to get it to a certain level. But boy, won't it be nice when these models work really well, that scaled everywhere? And my biggest concern always is that we have too many individual innovations, and how do you pull it together to create a more system change altogether? And that remains to be an issue I struggle a lot with. Last week, we, we had the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. We launched a report, Culture of Health, a lot on community initiative, you know, bringing together all different stakeholder pieces for solutions. We found nine great models. And my question is, well, if these models are great, how do we actually scale them? And Pam, your point about local issues are correct. 
I mean, many of them have to contextualize, and there are many regulatory issues that we have to face, including, you know, uh, top, uh, performing top of your profession, you know, certification, many other issues. I think that's where a balance between policy and innovation, a market-driven approach, which in fact is what you really heard, uh, that works really well. That how do you actually take that together with policy of a broader scale regulation and put them together so that we can see things moving forward much more effectively? Uh, so that's, I continue to think about this. I would love to have a conversation about how we get there. Great, thank you, Victor. I think uh, also great perspectives, especially going deeper into how these models you see fitting into uh, local context in parts of the U.S. Um, we don't have that much time, so I'm going to try to keep us moving quickly and also want to make sure we have time for um, uh, participation by the audience here. Uh, each of you touched, at least tangentially, on the political climate. Um, and I want to spend a few minutes just thinking a bit more about this and, and ask you in terms of, of two perspectives. Um, was mentioned perhaps we're moving to a more decentralized model that, that allows states or other types of communities to, uh, to serve as the um, models of implementation. Um, the second aspect we see, of course, is, is perhaps a shift in, in attitudes about how the U.S. relates to the rest of the world. And as we think about learning from different parts of the world, um, what are the opportunities or barriers in, in terms of the, the changes in the political climate in terms of being able to engage with and, and learn from our colleagues from around the world? Well, with regards to the first, um, yes, and for sure, I think that, you know, it's, it's very mom and apple pie to say that we want to give um, local authorities and, and, and local organizations more influence over how they make the investments that they do and how they engage. Of course, when there are public dollars involved, then um, policymakers have a greater stake in sort of setting the boundaries and the regulatory structure. Um, you know, I, I, I would say that it can be an iterative process to get to that happy medium. So, for example, I don't think that we, it's realistic to expect that we are going to see cohesive, community-based, community-oriented models pop up to cover most of the land or even more than half of the land, especially large metropolitan areas where there are lots of competitive organizations, very complicated market dynamics. That is simply not realistic in many places. So for those types of populations and areas, it may be much more fruitful to have a more generalized policy structure, a more generalized payment vehicle that you might, you know, you might offer a Chinese menu, for example, of this kind of benchmarking methodology, that kind of capitation, et cetera, and, but a, a, a narrow set of options, toddler's options for people to choose from. But where you can allow more of that local tailoring I think that it's worth experimenting to see how much of it we can tolerate. And so scaling from, the, from that perspective for those types of communities that really you know, can take a more cohesive, um, unified approach would look more like an open door from the government perspective. Our doors are open. Here are some broad parameters outside of which we are not comfortable going, but within them, come in and tell us what you have planned and, and let's discuss. So I, I think that if we are comfortable living um, in this in-between space and acknowledging that flexibilities are going to be more appropriate for some areas and not so much for other areas, then we could have a path forward. Apropos to my comment about rural care, I think there's a tremendous opportunity, in fact, uh, with asking states to solve their problem using the kind of models that we've learned. And I understand what's being said in, you know, complex cities. I, we, I lived in Boston and Philadelphia with all this thing. However, there's a big segment of our population who, in fact, requires some standard way of caring, and particularly the Medicaid population, I think there is an opportunity, as I'm thinking about this and looking at possible and the other models, that that actually, if a state were willing to take this on, as we are debating in North Carolina, 
that you could end up with a very good model for a big population, notwithstanding some of the things that's been said by Palm. So I, I, I think that there is a, to me, there is now a good opportunity to look at how to create some of these models at a much broader scale together, particularly looking at the rural population. Uh, internationally, I don't think it, I, I do not think it will be affected whatsoever because, you know, uh, uh, you know, certainly in our, in what we do, we learn so much from learning from each other and the scientific and health community will continue to interact and learn from each other. I doubt very much I imagine that this is going to be affected by the current uh, whatever policy that you can call it. Krishna, I may uh, attempt to put your two questions together. Um, during this uh, next administration, obviously, we, we see a movement towards states' rights and, uh, with that decentralization. Uh, but as this played out, um, you know, one might think uh, also about some of the policies that put the specter or the opportunity, and I'm, I'm sorry, Lou Sandy isn't here, uh, for insurance sales across state lines, which um, um, would offer the opportunity for really some key benefits packages that are consistent uh, across state lines. And uh, within that, then, you have the context for seeing what works best. Uh, and um, that opportunity for state-based experimentation is not dissimilar than the approach, frankly, we take uh, in my organization, uh, which operates um, uh, in about 23 states. And, um, you know, we, we don't try something new everywhere. We try something new somewhere and see if it works. Uh, and if it works well, we learn how to make it better, then we learn how to replicate, then we learn how to scale. And so um, I, I hope this serves as that opportunity. So that um, uh, platform then of potential key benefits package with the opportunity to try different approaches against that creates um, a natural experiment that I hope we take advantage of. Uh, the second in terms of the worldview um, is that uh, outside of these particular experiments, I think we have opportunities to learn uh, how public and private sector, how state uh, and federal rights uh, are balanced. Uh, well, um, compared to the United States, it has uh, more uh, in scale with a, a, a state. I think the Netherlands is really an interesting model because ultimately there is a public um, uh, set of specifications, not unlike, for example, an insurance company selling across state lines. Uh, on the other hand, that's implemented by private sector insurance companies that are that, that deliver that insurance contract uh, to which p private sector I'm sorry if I said public sector, I meant private sector, to which private sector uh, providers in turn um, um, uh, support uh, care to the requirements specified. So I, I think we should be looking actively to this question of how public and private sector negotiate this, um, this, this detente uh, that really preserves some degree of autonomy, particularly at the front lines, particularly at state level, uh, with um, uh, the broader um, uh, agenda. Uh, as well is that one other element of health that I think opens the door for this is something the United States has traditionally done well uh, and uh, I, I hope um, uh, continues uh, recognizing uh, everything that's transpired this past week in terms of the political context. Uh, and some of our best outreach is through health diplomacy. Health diplomacy opens the door not only for care improvement but really cross-cultural learning about uh, care delivery models. Thanks. Great. Thank you all for those thoughtful perspectives. Let me go to the audience now. Any questions? Yes. Don. Thank you, every, everyone. I want to ask a question to my and others can comment about community. Uh, it was about 30 years ago that I heard Henry Cisneros, former mayor of San Antonio, uh, at a cystic fibrosis meeting. He's a champion for cystic fibrosis. Uh, talk about community, he said, you know, if you want to find out what the community needs, why don't you ask the community? And that stayed with me all of these years because I don't think we found a way to get the authentic voice of the community. And part of the reason may be that defining the boundaries of the community and the common interests and integrating them is relatively rare. We've seen some good examples in Minneapolis, for example, <laughs> Uh, where uh, people of different backgrounds, ethnicities, and races were brought together to have, have a common voice. But I don't see much of this. Have you seen some examples or a path forward where we can leverage that, uh, I think, vital principle of community voice? Sorry, I still think it's vanishingly rare. I, I think I see sort of early versions of it happening in various places. So for example, 
the network of safety net organizations in South LA that got together and decided that they wanted to figure out how to create an accountable safety net system. Um, I think when CMS engaged the state of Vermont, while that was a very payer and provider centric conversation, it, it really did begin to pull in the public health agencies, the local community service organizations, and there was a whole state conversation about uh, what that model would look like. While it was focused on ACOs, it was a statewide budget for Medicare um, and an all-payer budget. So many voices had to be at the table and they're being judged on population health measures, not just on Medicare performance metrics. So, so there are early versions, but at the level of actually getting citizen voices, um, I think I haven't seen that so much. I don't know if you saw a report last week, or actually two weeks ago, called Health Equity, the Voices of Community. Uh, this, in fact, is a National Academy report supported by Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And uh, the focus is actually on this issue you know, how can you actually change or address health equity through the work of community? And I, I would agree with you that they, you know, there are difficult system level examples, not a lot of them, but there are lots of innovative one-off examples. And what we did is we brought together nine such examples, and the issue here is not just on health, but on any community activities, such as education, et cetera, because the idea would be these are social determinants. So if you demonstrate that people would come together from different sectors, cross sectors to address a problem, transportation, education, that's a starting point. So a starting point is really to learn how people, actually these communities bring people together as the voice or whatever to solve a problem and use these exemplars out there. So the real question is, where do we go from there? Are we going to have a, a repository of examples and information? We're going to do just as what you did here in terms of common care lessons learned and cross-cutting themes. And what, uh, what, do bring, what things bring people together? And then what we're going to do is do what we call a uh, incubator concept. That is to allow communities who actually begin to organize around one area or the other to ask, I'd like to learn how to do this, and what about those examples, and is this a knowledge hub and repository? A little bit like what Krishna and I did in innovation healthcare. Bringing the, the kind of people who've been the innovators who begin to work on this, not only learn from each other, but provide a forum for other people to come in, and to provide a forum for actually looking at how to get scale and how to get support to replicate. So that's the starting point. So I'm in agreement with you that that definition is very difficult, but the only way you can do it, I believe, is through examples and getting people who've done it and using the examples and then kind of the push-pull phenomenon rather than push and give more ideas to pull people in to say, how do we learn from this and how do we actually take it to the next community, et cetera. So that's what we're working on. I think your um, question about gathering the authentic voice of the community is really a plea for tighter integration of the public health enterprise with the healthcare services delivery. That was really driven home to me. I mentioned um, my American hospital experience. Uh, AHA had um, seven community conversations, and uh, really it was quite compelling uh, across the country how much interest there was in terms of the tighter linkage, and in fact how fractured or fragile those linkages had been previously. I'll again, invoke uh, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. I had the privilege this past year of chairing uh, or co-chairing a task force on improving the federal public health enterprise. Uh, and um, you know, the sh short message is what a missed opportunity for our Secretary of Health and Human Services at a national level, our state commissioners, and all local health commissioners to not view themselves, their roles as the chief health strategist for the country, for the state, for the municipality, uh, et cetera. Uh, and um, uh, within that, I think there is the opportunity to really seek out uh, as well as create a platform for that authentic community voice, uh, commensurate with um, uh, an opportunity to focus on um, uh, social determinants, health risk, population health, 
uh, risk stratification, and then the nexus with the care delivery system. Great. Thank you all. We have time for one or two more quick questions. One in the back. Thanks. Um, I might quickly betray myself as a Hamiltonian Federalist with this question, which isn't terribly politically popular right now, but what I'm having a hard time seeing as we talk about this community is that in a bunch of parallel policy areas, when you allow the communities to choose, their choices may be at odds with the quote-unquote socially optimal point that we're trying to get to in healthcare. So what happens if a community chooses to be McAllen, Texas, and to have incredibly high rates of inappropriate utilization of technologies that drive up costs. Are we allow that community to do so? The analog I always think about is public education. So that's been traditionally, of course, a state's rights is enfranchised in the Constitution. We have massive variations in educational outcomes, largely as a function of state spending and wealth. So if we go to the community, are we, allow, are we gonna be okay with massive disparities in care? I mean, how do we reconcile those two com seem to be really competing priorities in the conversation? So, so this is the work of policymaking. Uh, so, you know, we, we do not let uh, a thousand flowers bloom if we think that they're blooming in unconstructive ways because we are the stewards of taxpayer dollars and we are the stewards of, you know, one of the few national social service programs in the country in terms of Medicare and Medicaid. So we, we are public stewards and so, from that perspective, we have a responsibility to set some clear parameters. But within those parameters of trying to get to better health, um, you know, better patient experience, uh, lower cost, more sustainable systems, there's a whole lot of room for people to approach us with alternative strategies. I think that's all that you're hearing from the panel. And I don't think we're saying that we, 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 want, you, we, we want every community to set its own completely unfettered health goals, um, but rather within the context of what we, and I'm playing CMS here, no longer wearing the hat, but what, what we as Medicare or we as a commercial payer are able to sustain, um, what are your ideas? Well, after the communication, community has taken their shot, you've um, created an evidence base, and um, you know I think you, you have an evidence base there you can work to. One of the lessons that I've learned in large systems, uh, HCA as well as the VA before it, uh, is um, something that I found that accelerates uh, improvement, which is compatible with the sort of zeitgeist uh, and the issue raised, uh, which is that we want tenable, acceptable um, outcomes. And finally, it's completely consistent with everything we heard from the three presentations before. Tight specifications of the desired outcomes, not micromanaging the process. Um, you know, it, it's really interesting. Um, clinicians uh, tend to think in a diagnostic method, you might even call that a scientific method, and the opportunity for them to have data means that if you tightly specify the outcomes, they'll actually take note of those data and sort of rectify to those outcomes. And so I think we should put our focus, particularly at this moment, on tight specification of the outcomes uh, and leave the micromanagement of the process there. If you put the out focus on the outcomes, um, I, I think we'll create a pull uh, and, um, you know, fundamentally, that um, is probably more durable than a push process. I was planning not to, for not to take it personal, uh, but <laughs> thank you for the, for the challenge. So the McAllen, Texas is, uh, the update information is not like you said anymore. So after the article of Atulga one that six years ago, between four ACOs and three HMOs, a Medicare Advantage plan, have taken uh, McAllen out of the map regarding our reutilization. Number one, number two, when what happened there and was not in Atulga one this article. Is, is, is when you subdivide the group of Medicare patients. We, believe it or not, but we had the data when we started the ACO, we are cheaper than the average when you subdivide the data. What was happening was we have more dual eligible, more dialysis patients, 
that the average because a lot of poverty. So Hidalgo County is one of the top two poorest country county in the in America with 55% of diabetes patients and three times the average dialysis patient. Dialysis patient is $70,000 per piece. Dual labor is $40,000 per piece, but in many parts of the country, the dual labor is just higher in most of the country. So when you see the data in high risk, high cost patient, it's totally, uh, you know, and of course there is no time to talk about that here, but this is a long conversation. You need to put the data apart, uh, and that's another conversation. Great, thank you. We can keep going for a while, but unfortunately we're out of time. Uh, please join me in thanking our panelists for continuing this conversation for the morning. And as our panelists make their way back down, we're going to move to the, the closing. Um, first of all, in addition to thanking our panelists, I want to take this opportunity to thank Robin Osborne and the Commonwealth Fund that has, as Mark said this morning, been instrumental in, in driving this work. Robin Osborne is the Vice President and Director of the Commonwealth Fund's International Program in Health Policy uh, and Practice Innovations since 1997. She has responsibility for the fund's annual international symposium on health policy, annual international health policy surveys and comparisons of health systems data, the Commonwealth Fund Nuffield Trust International Conferences on Quality, the fund's international working group on quality indicators, the Harkness Fellows in Healthcare Policy and Practice, the Australian American Health Policy Fellowships and 22 international partnerships with ministries of health. Uh, so she brings a very strong policy and and international perspective to this work, and I'd like to invite Robin to, to give us some closing remarks today. Thanks very much for the lovely introduction. And let me just say, first of all, on behalf of the Commonwealth Fund, congratulations to Mark and to Krishna, to Andrea Toomey, and the whole team at Duke Margolis Center for this really brilliant meeting and the portfolio of work presented today. Um, special thanks to Mark for his ongoing visionary and uh, thinking about healthcare reform and accountable care organizations as a way of transforming our healthcare system. Uh, to all of our country speakers, for sharing their impressive and provocative uh, stories. The examples, very, very different examples, different country contexts, different healthcare systems, a lot of food for thought, uh, and for being so candid with uh, sharing their experiences. Uh, that really makes the learning uh, very easy for us not so easy to do it, but the learning is easy. And to thank them for those uh, incredibly rich case studies. Um, I think they really are, they've sort of set the bar up here for case studies for us. And of course, to our panel of US healthcare system leaders for so thoughtfully helping us crosswalk the lessons learned globally to our efforts here at home. Um, many of you know the Commonwealth Fund. We're a private, independent foundation established in 1918 with the mission of supporting a high-performing health care system that expands access to care, improves quality of care, and achieves greater efficiency. And we're particularly concerned and passionate about improving care for high-need, high-cost, and vulnerable populations. Integral to our work is an international perspective, and our international program in health policy and practice innovations aims to spark creative health policy thinking and exchange through uh, forums like today, through cross-national comparative research, the patient and doctor surveys that we do annually in 11 countries, through benchmarking health system performance, and through deep dive case studies like the ones we've had the privilege of hearing today to understand what works and what doesn't work across countries. 
Um, and through our delivery system reform program, with which we work very closely and synergistically, um, we try and take those lessons and, and bring them back to the U.S. So while every country healthcare system has a unique historical and political context, and they may be financed and organized differently, they're all being driven to get value from money. And there's a striking convergence in their goals and strategies. For the United States, that theme of value for money really resonates. We spend more on health care than any other country in the world. Um, as the fund's president, David Blumenthal, likes to say, if there was an Olympics for health care spending, the U.S. would sweep the gold, silver, and the bronze. But we certainly don't get the best outcomes all the time and often rank at the bottom, certainly in the Commonwealth Fund's own surveys when compared to 10 other industrialized countries. And while we absolutely have some of the best health care in the world um, and some of our outstanding and world-class U.S. health care systems are represented here today and are part of the project, um, for the U.S. on average nationally, the cross-national data shows room for improvement. Um, we're hopeful that with the introduction of accountable care and the kinds of delivery system and payment reforms that we've seen with the ACA, that some of these gaps in performance will close. Let me just give you sort of an example of how we're seeing this international work. Since 1998, the fund has held an annual international symposium in Washington, bringing together health ministers, senior government officials from, well now, it's about 16 countries, and around a theme. And for the first 10 years or so that we did this, when health ministers outlined their challenges and what their systems were, were facing, and their policy agendas, even though they all spoke in English, it was as if they were speaking a different language. The problems, the strategies, the words they used just didn't translate. There was little commonality. What's now striking, stunningly so, is the amount of convergence, particularly as we increasingly focus on patients with complex needs. The high-cost patients, often frail, elderly, with multiple chronic conditions, the kinds of patients that we heard about today. So in the last year or so, health ministers have shared with us what is really a very common vision for their health care systems. They're all aiming towards an integrated health care delivery system that provides high quality, seamless, coordinated care for chronically ill patients, that empowers and supports patients and their caregivers, where information follows the patients between providers across sites of care and from the health care system to the community, and a system that's innovative in using data and performance feedback to continually improve. They not only share a common vision, but I think what is also striking is they share strategies that sound remarkably similar, similar. And it sounds like they're all pretty much using the same toolbox. And I think we, we heard that today. Patients entered medical homes, um, and enhanced primary care, bundle payments, risk sharing arrangements among payers and providers, payment based on quality metrics, not volume, et cetera. And of course, what's so interesting is that because each system is different, how they use these tools and how each system implements these kinds of transformative changes is different. And that's why today is so incredibly timely, so exciting to have the opportunity to hear about different accountable care models in different countries, how they work, and to be able to learn from these other experiences in real time. Um, the work that the Duke team has undertaken is incredibly ambitious, uh, particularly impressive uh, are the stakeholders advisory board that they've assembled and the level of commitment that they've uh, shown to this project. 
um, but also the very original and practical way that the Duke team is approaching this project. Sourcing, uh, the way they're sourcing accountable care models from around the world, applying a universal conceptual framework to them, and then in a very granular, granular way drawing out key insights. And that you've heard a lot about today at the policy and the regulatory level, the organizational level, and on the front lines to understand what works and what doesn't. And then crosswalking that back to the US healthcare system. Um, they didn't talk much about it today, but I think you're gonna see it very shortly, is the interactive playbook that they've created with detailed case studies and toolkits. It's really a pioneering work and represents a groundbreaking model for how we can think about international innovations and cross-national learning. This work is synergistic with another large project that the Commonwealth Fund and the Institute for Healthcare Improvement has underway. Dr. Don Goldman is here and he leads that work to transfer frontline delivery system innovations from other countries to the US working with a network of uh, 15 uh, delivery systems here in the US. Um, again, scanning the international landscape, doing deep dive case studies, assessing the feasibility and the business case, and beginning this year uh, piloting some of these innovations. These two projects are, I think they're really breakthroughs. Um, it's been far more routine for other countries to do study tours of the US, to go and visit our exemplary, world-class leading healthcare systems and take back the ideas that they've found inspiring. With the great work that we've seen here today uh, that the Duke Mar Margolis team is doing, we have a wonderful opportunity to draw on and benefit from this international experience and learn from each other about how accountable care is implemented and achieves some of the, the fine impacts that it does in other countries. So um, thanks to all of you for participating in today, to the uh, Duke team for their work. And I hope that we'll be back here again in a year to tell you about how we're taking some of the lessons learned from these inspiring models and transmitting them to the US healthcare system. Many thanks. Thank you, Robin. And thank you again to the Commonwealth Fund. Also, before we break, I just wanna take a minute to also thank the rest of our Duke Margolis team who's been instrumental in doing this work, Andrea Toomey, Jonathan Gonzalez-Smith, Kushal Kadakia, and our communications team led by Ellen de Graff and Reed. I think we, we see clearly a pathway going forward. We've heard over and over that, that it's important to understand the journey, not just the vision and the destination, but, uh, but to make sure that there's a pathway that's shared. We've also seen, I think, real evidence that accountable care is becoming a global movement, not just a, a US-centric model, and in fact has drawn together a global community that can connect both at a grassroots or community level, but also in, in helping to share lessons learned about policy and, and payment reform. And finally, that uh, we continue to see that, that transformation really requires integration. You have to think about policy, we have to think about payment systems, and we have to think about the delivery of health services and technologies as interconnected components. And to do that requires active facilitation, evidence generation, and really being able to bring key stakeholders together. So with that, I'll say uh, this is certainly not a representation of the end of our work. It's really the beginning of our journey. We have an evidence base. We have a community that, uh, that we continue to grow. Uh, and I hope all of you in the room and all of you online as well come along on this journey with us. So thank you very much for being here today and have a great rest of your afternoon.